All right, folks, welcome. You're in Palace One for our talk here is Buying into Bias, Why Vulnerability Statistics Suck with Brian Martin, a.k.a. Jericho, and Steve Christie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So if you're not in the right place, go ahead and leave. No uh, hard feelings. We're going to briefly uh, talk about why vulnerability statistics suck, and we say that meaning all of them in the past, the present, and likely the future, and what little shred of hope we have moving forward. Uh, you've been warned, PG-13, sometime I have random outburst. One of the things I like to do uh, for any talk is say, why us? Why are we qualified to speak? Steve has been running CVE, uh, which all of you should be familiar with, since 1999. It's a specialty vulnerability database. I'm the content manager of the open source vulnerability database, and I've been running my own uh, private one before that, back to 94. So we've been collecting and analyzing vulnerabilities for a long time. That's the big takeaway there. Uh, this topic is kind of boring. We did a lot to try to make it a little more interesting. So one of the things I did is I put out a call on Twitter saying if you want any random goofy animal in the presentation, tell me. We got 24 requests and all of them are in here. <laughs> <clears throat> so one of the big things that uh, people seem to miss, why does this matter? Why is this topic important? First, vulnerability stats, favorite talking point for media horrors. They love talking about stats, they don't understand them one bit. Uh, they're frequently used for really bad comparisons, whether it's a system, uh, a web browser, or whatever. Uh, the security industry, it's an industry of integrity, supposedly, but if our stats have none, where are we? How can we really tell if we're making progress if our stats are bad and they go to bad again? And last, people make security decisions, big ones, very important ones based on these stats, and that's kind of depressing. So why are vuln stats totally worthless? And we're gonna go into detail more on this. They're inconsistent on abstraction, which we'll get into. There's significant gaps in coverage. That's for every VDB out there. Uh, specific focus, not caring about historical, or some examples of why bias starts to creep in. Bad analysis, oops. Um, entries are based on whatever the vendor says. They're not always root uh, cause analysis. So what that leads is to people making absurd claims. This is not our chart. This has been floating around for six, nine, 15 months, who knows. <laughs> but this is really not very far from the stats we see. Everyone likes to say correlation is not causation. There you go. So the talking points, we're gonna define the bias. We're gonna go into researcher bias. We even have some researchers here we're gonna call out, thug. Uh, vendor bias, uh, VDB bias, we're going to show some bad stats, some kind of good ones are going in the right direction, and then we're going to conclude it. We'll take any Q&A in here, time permitting, and if not, we'll be outside and answer your questions there. So with that, Steve's up. All right, so even with the animals, this part might be a teeny bit boring. I'm going to try and go through it uh, pretty quickly. We are going to have our slides available uh, pretty much immediately after the presentation. Some of this material is a little bit uh, is a little bit dense, but uh, this has build, been building up for us for a long time, and we just got to get it out. Fortunately, the problem that we have here uh, has been seen in other uh, vocations as well. It's a well-known, well-established problem of bias in statistics for a couple hundred years. For me, one of the big models that is um, interesting is epidemiology, the study of diseases in humans. Uh, vulnerabilities are kind of like diseases in software. So, um, and we have a lot of sampling issues, and uh, we, but we don't use measuring devices that are as accurate or as reliable as simple things like thermometers or uh, blood pressure monitors. So our claim is that for vulnerability research, we are far worse off right now than other disciplines are. And fortunately, uh, nobody's gonna die as a result of this. Oh, except we have this internet of things, cars, planes, trains, automobiles. So yeah, this is uh, disconcerting. Bias, I have it, you have it, we all have it. Some of it's good, a lot of it's bad. Uh, and there are a couple different definitions for bias as well, but the one that we want to emphasize is the notion of statistical bias, which basically, um, 
says how bad a statistic is relative to the real world population that it's trying to study. Unfortunately, with all the vulnerability collections we have out there are only approximations, they're only samples of all the vulnerabilities that are out there. Not, they're not even comprehensive with respect to all the publicly known vulnerabilities, and we'll get into why that's an issue. So for our talk, we're gonna be concentrating on four main types of bias. Selection bias is what is the topics, what are the subjects that you actually select for your study? Publication bias is once you've gone and studied them, what are you gonna say about them or are you not even gonna say anything at all? See any parallels here? And then abstraction bias is something that is kind of, seems kind of unique to us, which is we don't even know how to count our own stuff. When you're doing disease studies, it's very easy to count the number of people. But for us, we have these weird abstract concepts like vulnerabilities or incidents or malware families or whatever. All of these things are much more fuzzy, much more problematic for counting. And surprise, surprise, people go in different ways to do that. So we have ourselves some abstraction bias. And then there's measurement bias, where if you aren't even measuring things correctly, all your statistics are gonna be way off. They're not gonna be reflecting reality. So these are the four kinds of things that we're really gonna try and touch on. So let's get into some selection bias. Okay, selection bias being uh, what, you sub what you choose for your study, okay? In the vulnerability research context, for example, researchers might choose to focus on certain products or they might only look for a couple different vulnerability types. And you researchers know who you are. And that's normal and that's expected. But nonetheless, that's a pretty significant bias just on the researcher side. For vendors, they might only concentrate on uh, certain uh, issues or certain parts of their software based on their own kind of internal uh, priorities. For vulnerability databases, we cannot scrape the entire internet, although Jericho certainly tries. Okay, so we have to work with a narrower set of sources that we monitor. So that in and of itself imposes a bias as well. One kind of selection bias that we kind of like, more than just the name, is attrition bias. That's where uh, in like a longitudinal or a time-based study, the subjects that you're studying kind of like drop out over time, and that can screw up your statistics. Think about a weight loss study where maybe halfway through the study, the people who aren't losing weight drop out, and then at the end of the study, hey, everybody lost all this weight. I don't know why I'm talking about weight loss studies, but anyway, um, so you lose the subjects during the time period of the study, and the statistics all of a sudden are not representing what you originally started with. That's a little bit of an issue there. So for researchers, researchers come in, do a bunch of disclosures, drop in, drop out all the time. There's attrition all over the place on an individual researcher basis. Uh, for vendors, if a product reaches end of life, well, they're not investigating that product anymore. Uh, there may be new vulnerabilities that come out that affect the old product, but we aren't necessarily gonna know. Vendors not necessarily gonna know. So these are some kinds of attrition that happens. Another kind of bias that occurs with this, just the selection is sampling bias, where you don't really do a non-random sample. And there may be very good reasons to do that. For example, which products are you gonna cover, or which vulnerabilities, or what are the most severe issues that you're going to cover once you've determined what products you're gonna cover. So for example, researchers, uh, nobody knows how to do everything, so they go based on what their own skills and preferences are, that's their own sampling error. Um, for vendors, they might not, not necessarily prioritize low, uh, low risk issues very much. And for vulnerability databases, we get into all these arguments about whether something really is a vulnerability or not. Does it qualify for inclusion in that VDB? Now getting into publication bias. Once we've found these results, do we publish them or not? Okay, and there are a couple different kinds. One of them is uh, the tendency to report positive results. In our context, this means reporting vulnerabilities if they've been found. So, you know, researchers might publish only high profile vulnerabilities or the most serious. Vendors, on the other hand, might only publish high priority issues as long as they have a patch for it. And vulnerability databases, we have our own criteria for which things we will publish or not. So there might be real vulnerabilities out there that we see, but if it's not in the scope of what we're covering, we're not necessarily gonna publish. 
There's also the negative aspect of uh, publication where you are not actually publishing issues, okay? So, for example, some researchers, they're not necessarily gonna publish anything that's like a low risk or, re or a really lame vulnerability type. Um, another, some might not publish at all because of, say, legal threats. And then there are some cases where a researcher might go and they might go and pound on some piece of software for 10 hours and not find anything. And yet they're not gonna tell anybody publicly about that. Yet to me, that seems to be a pretty good indicator of the relative strength of the software. This is a huge knowledge gap that we have in the entire industry. So abstraction bias, getting to how we count things. This really boils down to what people in the science world think of as units of measurement. We have a lot of different units of measurement that get kind of combined and mixed up. We have advisories on one hand, we have vulnerabilities, we have bug IDs, we have the number of actions for administrators to take, and yet the terminology is not necessarily precise enough and we get it mixed up all the time. One of the main things is though, each unit of measurement, each kind of abstraction, serves a different audience. So for example, vendors want to push out information but not overwhelm an admin, so they might combine a whole bunch of issues into a single advisory. On the other hand, people like uh, Brian and others in the vulnerability database world, they might try and assign a unique ID or create an individual record for every single individual vulnerability. And we used to do that at CVE, but we don't do that anymore, and we haven't for a long time. Because for us, we're kind of strange in that we are trying to coordinate information across diverse communities. So this means we actually sort of evolved to this weird middle level of abstraction. And this is one of the reasons why CVE seems to count things really differently. But if you're someone who assumes that each CVE is equivalent to one vulnerability, that assumption has been wrong for about 10 years. So a couple other examples for abstraction bias. You might have one researcher that finds one core issue, then releases a bunch of advisories. Vendors, as I've talked about, might combine many uh, individual issues into a single advisory. For vulnerability databases, each database has its own audience and its own need for certain analytical depth, which might cause it to have different kinds of abstraction and thus uh, count things differently. So let's work from a little bit of ground truth. Okay, this is a graph on the very far left are the numbers of Microsoft advisories released between 2009 and 2012. Towards the right are what some of these different well-known information sources, how they actually count vulnerabilities or the number of IDs they have based on that original raw uh, 83 or 100 Microsoft advisories. And you can see there's a big difference here. CVE winds up being somewhere in the middle. OSVDB, through a quirk of Microsoft, uh, seems to be about equivalent to CVE. But in general, if you work from the same piece of raw vulnerability information, there would be about 1.5 OSVDB IDs for every one CVE that would come out of it. And then on the far right, we have uh, ISS X-Force that is maybe double counting or triple counting, we're not sure. They actually produce non-unique IDs, so they have a lot of duplicates. So now we'll get into measurement bias, okay? Measurement is really a key thing that we need to deal with in vulnerability research, but we don't have very reliable devices. We don't have anything like a thermometer for vulnerability research. You put two different researchers on the same product with the same amount of time, they're gonna come up with completely different results. Anybody who's looked into automated code analysis know that uh, at best, um, automated code analysis is challenging. And you use different tools, come up, come up with completely different results. These are our measuring devices, okay? So, um, and some examples of bias that can occur, researchers may tend to hype the severity of the issues that they find. Vendors, on the other hand, might choose to underestimate the severity, maybe they don't fully understand the issue or they're just plain disagreements. Okay, vulnerability databases are kind of stuck in the middle and may completely misinterpret what's being reported. And actually, um, this is a, a quote that we have here from uh, NSS Labs. 
Okay, more than 90% of all the publicly reported vulnerabilities are either moderately critical or highly critical. If you think about it, that's kind of weird. 90% of everything that's reported we have to act on right now? 10,000 vulnerabilities a year? There's something about that measurement that just doesn't quite make sense. Doesn't quite help us to really prioritize what's the really most absolute important stuff to deal with. And these are some of the problems we have with measurement. So let's talk a little bit about CVSS, everybody's uh, favorite thermometer. CVSS has a lot of mathiness to it. It is very well adapted, adopted. It's used a lot. I helped to produce CVSS version two, so I will admit that I'm a bit of a CVSS apologist. I will stand up for it, but it does have limitations, okay? So for example, um, CVSS version two has a built-in bias that is basically you score the impact to the entire system. Disagree. And Brian disagrees. Why is that? How can that be that we even have such a fundamental disagreement? Well, it turns out that the documentation isn't necessarily fully clear and people, different individuals will apply CVSS in different ways. We actually tried to design it so that there would be consistency but obviously, okay, when the two speakers can't even, uh, excuse me, can't even agree, I forgot, I have to breathe every once in a while. Okay, um, on the other hand, so you could possibly have a maximum score of seven, but if you're Dan Kaminsky and you find a DNS bug that, you know, can break the entire internet, well, you only get a 6.4. So there's, while I think there are strengths to CVSS, there are certainly some limitations of it as a measurement device. So looking at a report that was done by uh, SourceFire, okay, they took a, a pie chart of all the different vulnerability types that had been reported, and they took the ones that all had CVSS score 10, the absolute worst one. And okay, buffer errors is up there, that's not necessarily a surprise. Okay, but the second largest category is not enough information. How can we score a 10 if there's not enough information? Well, the fact is that uh, CVSS guidance is conservative. If you don't know uh, what the issue is, then you assume the highest risk. So we have a large percentage of vulnerabilities that are published without much detail at all that are automatically given a CVSS 10. And then if you look at some of these categories highlighted up at the top, cross-site scripting and SQL injection, those are very low percentages. And yet we all know how numerous SQL injection and cross-site scripting is. How did they get a 10 to begin with? And I, yeah, I wonder also, how did some of these get a 10 to begin with? No matter who you agree with scoring-wise, those don't get a 10. Yeah. <clears throat> so now, taking things, making it even worse, all these different kinds of bias that we talked about from these different sources can all combine together and get chained together in really weird, complicated ways that make it difficult, I would say perhaps even impossible, to really figure out what's going on there. And all of that at the tail end is your vulnerability statistics. With all of these problems in here, not very well understood and certainly not explained particularly well. There's a disclaimer here, bias is not always bad. Okay, so um, the big thing is to really qualify it and then to, uh, and then to disclaim it. So with that, I'll pass on to Brian. <clears throat> okay, so sources of bias, we've already mentioned the three kinds, researcher, vendor, and VulnDB, and we'll go through those in a little more uh, detail. So first, we'll start out with the researcher bias. They just wanna disclose all the vulns, right? Researcher bias is based on skills, focus, and disclosure. Um, some kinds of vulnerabilities they can find. Cross-site scripting, anyone in the room can find that. Bang in some script code, hey, magic, works. Some people can find SQLI only via certain methods. Some cannot find memory corruption. You know, it just takes some skill that you may or may not have. All of that influences these stats. Then the publication bias, what's the severity? Everyone loves to see code execution. Remote code execution? That's the money shot, right? So that's what we tend to see from some of these researchers. And in finding other vulnerabilities, they're like, I don't want to take you know, the thunder from that RCE. I'm going to forget about, oh, all the stuff that led up to that or the other eight vulnerabilities I found. 
Um, notable examples of researcher and selection publication bias. Litchfield, uh, Cornbrust, and Ceruto versus the unbreakable Oracle. How many Oracle volumes do we see now? So that was a matter of a few people said, you know, I think that guy is full of shit. I'm going to prove him wrong, and they did. Um, back in the day, there was a, a common theme, the month of whatever bugs. And one researcher or a team would release 30 or 31 days of vulnerabilities in a web browser, in a PHP app, ActiveX, whatever. Well, what does that do to the stats? It starts to elevate certain ones. Then you have the Dino, what we call the Dino Dilemma. Memory corruption? Yeah, he's going to publish that. Cross-site scripting? He's not going to waste his time. And the Oberhide Oversight, our fun name, uh, not publishing can cost you $10,000. Um, we have more information on that in the slides. Download it. Fun stuff. So the four eyes of measurement bias. Incomplete, inaccurate, inconsistent, incomprehensible. Every day when we're measuring these, and by we, the VDBs, measuring or collecting and aggregating vulnerability information, this is what we're up against. And one thing that we have consistently seen and noted is that when a researcher works with a vendor, a lot of that goes away. Of course, there's all kinds of other challenges and hurdles and problems and why the hell would I ever do that? That's another dilemma. So in 2008, there was a young man Nate, that went by the name Rot. That's a zero, R0T. He uh, would download some software, usually a PHP app, set it up. Sometimes he'd go to the vendor site. Sometimes they had a demo, sometimes they didn't. And he would do the blatantly simple SQL injection and uh, cross-site scripting attacks. So he would do this for 10 minutes, maybe, on a given product or a site, and he would move on. And he would immediately mail all the vulnerability databases, full disclosure, bug track, probably his aunt. You know, he was very prolific in, in, yeah, making sure everyone knew about this. So what did that lead to? That's what his disclosures look like mapped across time. And if you look at those numbers in one year, one person did 450 disclosures or vulnerabilities. That's a lot. That's and living hell on us. And these peaks, perhaps uh, coincidentally, happen to align with Christmas holiday and school vacation. Summer, summer break, yeah. So this, yeah, those 450 weren't, oh, averaged out over 12 months. That was like three months of hell. <clears throat> so the rot speed bump, what does this look like uh, for our ID schemes? And OSVDB, you can see his in red, and you can start to see the proportion of his disclosures versus the rest. And with CVE. So regardless of the database, regardless of the way we abstract, he was a significant influence. One young kid, bored, doing that. One of the, I think Steve came up with the term grep and gripe. It's been around forever in our world. So basically you use the tool grep against some source code. You see some signs that there may be a problem and you gripe about it. You go post a full disclosure or bug track or whatever. It's a very effective method. It's also got a lot of false positives. So you have some uh, risk versus reward there. So uh, Dimitri, in the August of 2008, that's a single month, said, I'm going to look for Simlink vulnerabilities. Look at the influence that one person had against all other Simlinks reported over time. So again, one person, one researcher has the power to influence not only vulnerability stats worldwide, but they influence our work cycles. They influence, influence our budget, the way we budget time, if we need more money to get extra people to keep up with it. It's pretty crazy. Uh, you want to stand up there, Mr. Cash Dollar? Yeah? Any of you run Ruby? Anyone? Ruby? Ruby on Rails, Gems. He is your arch nemesis right now. Thank you, thank you. So uh, Larry over there, he decided, you know, I'm going to look for two specific types of vulnerabilities in Ruby and Ruby Gems. Look at the influence he had. The beauty of this one is that leading up to this, everyone said, you know, Ruby is pretty secure. I, I don't hear about many vulnerabilities in it. And there's a few here as, you know, researchers start to, to really drill down on it and say, what are the capabilities? Then Larry comes along and says, yeah. <laughs> Um, false positives. 
This is the bad side of the grep and gripe. Yeah, you grep for include, you see, oh, it looks like a remote file inclusion vulnerability, which is essentially remote code execution, and you tell all the VDBs. We see that, and when we see that that's how they achieved their result, we scream. Because now we either have to blindly trust them, that's a 50-50 thing, or we have to go spend time to figure out, okay, is it correct? Fortunately, there's about half a dozen people in the world going up against all disclosures, up to 10,000 a year, that do their best to try to verify these findings. And we don't have time to do them all. So another good example, what happens when a couple people look at a single product? Who in here uses FFmpeg? Okay, now for the maybe five to 10% that raised your hand, good. The other 90%, you're using it too. You just don't know it. FFmpeg is a library essentially, it's used in a ton of products. All of these vulnerabilities affect you. So we had a few people that are looking for vulnerabilities in that. Now, look what happens. Researcher attrition bias. This is one of our best examples. Everyone familiar with Zero Day Initiative, ZDI? Vulnerability broker service, basically. They'll buy vulnerabilities, they'll responsibly disclose, give it to their customers, the whole works. So a while back, uh, there was an interesting tweet from them. It's so quiet at the office today, I wonder what happened. Some of us kind of knew what was going on. Two months later, look at the dip. Why is that? Over half of their staff left to form a new company. So now, why is this important? ZDI would basically only release high-end critical remote code execution vulnerabilities. These are your CVSS 9.3, which is context-dependent code execution. Have a web browser, click this page, you're owned. Or straight up 10.0, Cyber Pompeii, I'm gonna own your server without any interaction. So now, because of their big shift, we see that big dip. The Luigi lossage, uh, selection and publication bias. So Luigi, back in the day, and actually this is kind of fascinating, he used to do find uh, vulnerabilities in games, uh, like Call of Duty and all this. Most of them were either uh, remote denial of service, annoying, some of them were remote code execution, but it's kind of cool watching all these games get hit. Then he figures out, hey, SCADA, that's what I'm gonna go after. And he starts releasing just tons and tons of SCADA. This one guy severely impacted all the SCADA stats, which we've all seen for the past two years. Oh, SCADA, it's important, it's big, you know? So, 2012, toward the end, what happened? Why did his disclosures go away? He founded a company with a friend, and now they don't publish them to the list anymore. They sell them to their clients. So once again, now, all those vulnerability stats, the causation, correlation, it's like, wow, SCADA vulnerabilities are down this year. Cool, things are getting better. No, 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 they're just staying private. Abstraction, and this is a good example. So uh, if anyone knows MustLive, yeah. He likes publishing uh, advisories in the same software, the same exact vulnerability. So what you see here, that convoluted chart, you're not even supposed to read it for that reason. That's one vulnerability. That's also 12 or so of his advisories because that same thing is used in so many WordPress plugins. But what do we see? Oh, new vulnerability in you know, blah, blah, blah for WordPress every other day. We have to go figure out where the root cause is. Some VDBs like OSVDB say, no, that's all one vulnerability, that's all it counts for, and that's the product listing in it because it affects so much. Other VDBs are like, well, it affects different products, so we're gonna abstract on that. So now you have this huge swing in stats depending on the source you use. Uh, fuzz marking, uh, Kaminsky et al. They used a fuzzer against a few uh, different office platforms. And this is kind of cool because they generated great data. Uh, they minimized the bias across the board. The same tool, the same methodology, basically the same abuse to all of them and then compare the results and they shared their entire methodology. And that's beautiful because now anyone in the room can say, you know, I can repeat that. I can validate their findings, or if I find a discrepancy, I can go to them and say, why didn't you notice this? And with this, we'll go to the vendor bias and Steve will take care. Can you forward that a second? I need to disassociate myself from that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, with vendors, different vendors have different ways of uh, publishing advisories. There's a whole lot of uh, variation there that we'll uh, touch on. 
Um, so for vendor publication bias, some vendors don't give any public access to their vulnerability advisories at all. Uh, SAP is a good example. Juniper did this all the way up until uh, just a couple months ago. So before that time, if you went and you looked up for vulnerability information about Juniper, you didn't find anything because it wasn't publicly known. All right, that's a pretty big impact. There are some vendors that will not report uh, vulnerabilities that they discovered themselves. They'll only publicly report stuff that external researchers found. And that has a big impact on statistics, which we'll get into in a second. Some vendors, for various pro or con reasons, might not uh, choose to report low severity issues very often. Where does this come into play? Well, here's a pie chart from uh, the recent source fire report, okay, uh, um, which basically uh, compared a whole bunch of different products just in terms of the raw numbers of vulnerabilities that they had. And the author expressed surprise that, gee, the Linux kernel, that seems so secure and yet it had way more vulnerabilities reported than anyone else did. Well, um, it could be that maybe if you look on the far right hand side, the Linux kernel reported a whole bunch of pretty low severity issues and only a relatively small percentage of high severity issues. What you see here is a, um, is a distribution of CVSS scores. So we normalized uh, based on the raw number of vulnerabilities and only looked at the uh, severities. And if you look on the far left-hand side, you see these desktop applications, Office, um, you know, Acrobat, and so on. Uh, part of this is because for CVSS scoring, uh, the assumption needs to be made that you are running, that you're an admin on Windows running these apps, which nobody should do. But guess what? That gives a very large CVSS score to pretty much everything. So there's some of the bias of CVSS influencing this. And um, when you compare vendors as well, you, you get to see a little bit more indication that some vendors really don't disclose uh, a whole lot of low severity issues. And yet when you're going and counting vulnerabilities, this has a big impact on that if you aren't looking a little bit deeper. Uh, some of the measurement issues that can occur with vendors, some of them is not only underestimating the severity, but also overestimating the severity. When it comes to memory corruption these days, right, finding a memory corruption is easy. Going and writing out an exploit and proving remote code execution is hard. So a lot of people take, I think appropriately, a conservative uh, approach and say, well, if we don't know for sure, then let's assume code execution. But that artificially inflates the severity of a lot of these issues relative to what the reality is, which none of us knows. Uh, vendors count differently as well, potentially. Uh, you know, first they might abstract based on the customer action or patch. Don't necessarily want to overwhelm sysadmins with every single individual report. And yet a lot of vendors also use CVE, which count differently. And uh, some of them may look at things and, and abstract a little bit more based on code fix or how they characterize a particular vulnerability. So you could have like a SQL injection and cross-site scripting that are all fixable with a single one-line input validation step that just converts something into a number. And so a vendor might seem to undercount something simply based on how they look at the fix or how they personally uh, classify the vulnerability, which as we've already talked about, there's a whole lot of inconsistency in how people count or classify those. CVSS further influences uh, vendor, uh, vendor measurements. So, um, you know, Oracle and HP seem to have a whole lot of uh, very high CVSS 10.0 vulnerabilities in this long-term study that Sourcefire did. Well, okay, but Oracle up until a couple years ago published no information whatsoever, so they got a 10.0 by default. HP didn't publish information at all. Guess what? They got a 10.0 by default. If you're familiar with Oracle and HP, now they include CVSS scores and the full CVSS vectors. That are also often incorrect. That are also often incorrect, but you know, one might wonder if getting a CVSS 10.0 for not saying anything maybe got to somebody in the wrong place at the wrong time. In addition, because uh, you know, Oracle now owns Java, Java gets a, a 10.0 if you have any kind of code execution because of the bias in CVSS for um, assuming somebody running on a Windows box uh, with admin privilege. So we'll pass it back to Brian for vulnerability database bias. 
Okay, so the world of vulnerability disclosure, not to scale. Um, I think the takeaway here is that it's very convoluted. Uh, download the slides later and read this and digest it. <laughs> okay, intentional selection bias by VDBs. So what products are covered? Uh, what sources do we monitor? And this is a big one. Most people just say, hey, the VDB exists. It has all the vulnerabilities, right? No, no VDB is complete. No VDB is remotely close to complete. We are all horrible at cataloging public vulnerabilities, every single one of them. And if you take that to heart and you think about all the stats that are generated off of our hard work that I am calling complete crap, it puts it into perspective. And that's just basically a time and resource limitation. But each one has a list of resources that they monitor. If we, like for example, I monitor IBM product change logs. I actually go read all of those. CVE generally does not. CVE monitors some sources that we generally do not. And so yeah, there's also this wonderful inbreeding among VDBs and who watches who. That's another talk with booze away from recorders. Um, so patch or workaround availability, site specific, which is out of our scope, uh, time of disclosure, uh, like I said, change long hunting. There, there's so many different ways that our databases are biased and we don't even know all of them. I had to sit here and think for this slide, wait a minute, what affects our stats or our collection? There's the unintentional selection, the raw volume of disclosures. Once again, the list of monitored sources, staffing expertise, false positives, and the overhead beyond content generation. Because we are essentially a business and we have more to do than just track those volumes. VDB publication bias. Uh, one of the things that bothered me for many years, and it bothered a lot of other people, is that a VDB would see a disclosure, they would create an entry for it, and that was it. So in 2006, Steve Christie found a remote vulnerability in Windows. That's a 10.0 CVSS, he could remotely execute code. And to this day, a lot of VDBs might say exactly that. What really happened is a month later, someone followed up to him and said, wait a minute, your finding is complete crap. You don't have RCE, you've got a limited remote denial of service at best. Very few databases go back and make those updates. So now we have serious skewing on these old reports. So one of the things we did for OSVDB is we made a series of flags. We wanted to know, was the vulnerability disputed? Was it third party disputed or did the vendor dispute it? Uh, did we verify it? Is a fix or workaround available? Is it not a vulnerability? Meaning the person says, hey, this is a denial of service. Technically you're right, but it's a self denial of service. It has no other impact than me clicking X and closing the program. So what you claimed is accurate, but it's not a vulnerability. And then we also have what we call myth fake. And that's where you said, hey, this is remote code execution. Steve comes behind you and says, no, you're all wrong. We flag it third party disputed, and then based on our research or someone else, or if the vendor also says, no, they're wrong, then we call it myth fake, because now we want to track those statistics. And because we also track credit we can tell you which researchers are finding vulnerabilities versus complete crap. Um, so one of the other things that's kind of fun is the VDBs. They're not all created equal, and that's by design. Uh, some of them are very targeted or specialty. Uh, CVE, back in the day, uh, he called it a vendor or a vulnerability dictionary or something. I said, yeah, you're wrong. You're a specialized VDB. And he said, okay, yeah, fine, you're right. So CVE serves a very specific purpose and they do an outstanding job at that. They have made all of our lives easier by facilitating communication between the researchers, the vendors, the VDBs, and everyone. But as such, it's not in their job description to track every single vulnerability out there. They don't need to know that there was a vulnerability in Amber's PHP golf program 1.3 because no one uses it. Where on the other hand, the comprehensive VDB, OSVDB, we want to track that. Oh, another fun one, selection bias in action. So I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll talk on this a little bit. Uh, yeah, so yeah, one, thing, yeah, one thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to be a little, on CVE, we're trying to be a little bit more direct with uh, our sponsors and our uh, customers and the public uh, about where we're going to go and uh, look for vulnerability information. 
And um, uh, basically, we formalized this with the CVE editorial board. Uh, so we looked through a number of different sources, some of which uh, we pretty much have to have full coverage for. Uh, and then other sources, like maybe including OSBDB, uh, that we only need partial coverage for. We also have a specific target list of products that uh, we must have uh, coverage for within CVE. And that's the list right there. It's findable on the CVE website as well. But as far as I know, we are the only ones in the vulnerability database land who is public with this information. Because if you think about it, sources, uh, where you get your vulnerability information is kind of proprietary. So in CVE, we originally had the goal, hey, we'll catch all publicly known vulnerabilities. And we did pretty good for a while, um, uh, but then the, just the volume became too great. And the it, sources, the, the spreading to... The sources and the spreading was an issue, and actually the, the, the percentage of crap was also very problematic. Um, Brian complains about it a lot, but yet he uh, does better with it. Um, in some cases, we intentionally in exclude stuff, just like with OSVDB. We don't include these site-specific issues, stuff that's on, a, that's on a, web, a website or some you know, SaaS offering or something like that. The customer has no control over fixing that issue. Those are out of our scope. Um, you know, certain kinds of technologies or new product classes um, we prefer and try to cover, even if they aren't necessarily on our formal sources and, uh, and products list. And then other things kind of fall by the wayside. The PHP golf application or PHP basket weaving, you know, we'll get to those when we get to those, but we don't need to cover those. We are not going to cover the Marconi telegraph vulnerability from 1904. Three. Okay. Sloppy. They, they got it. I'm comfortable not covering that vulnerability. All right. Um, but then you get into, let's say, an instant messaging application that's used by millions and millions of users in another country that's not, that's not English-based. This is yet another selection bias that, uh, that we English-based vulnerability database sources have. We aren't covering the rest of the world software except if it's also available in English. Actually, Japan. Most of us cover Japan now because they have a formal JP cert that also releases some of their advisories in English. So we have a decent glimpse into that. Another impact that occurs on selection bias that, again, we will be open with you about and others may not, is uh, just like an individual researcher can have a big impact on statistics, adding or removing an individual team member can have a big impact on statistics. So there were a lot of reports about, oh, that were based on CVE and NVD. They were like, you know, oh, last year we saw a significant increase in vulnerabilities. It wasn't a significant increase in the number of disclosed vulnerabilities, although that was the case. What they were really observing was we added a new team member to the analysis and then suddenly our productivity increased. And by the way, we've added more team members and they're pretty much done with their training and they're starting to produce some stuff. We're starting them with some uh, small PHP applications. But think about the increases that are gonna happen this year because we've expanded our team that are going to get reported in 2014 as this you know, massive increase in the vulnerability stats, when really we just added more people to our team. And this kind of change, this kind of influence happens with everybody. Uh, by the way, um, we are going to be uh, crossing more than 10,000 CVEs at some point within a year or two. Um, we are changing the CVE ID syntax so that if we need to go to additional digits, we will. There's more information on the CVE website. I've been spamming everybody. Uh, come to me if you want, but I uh, thought that was important to mention. Another statistic that is very commonly done is that there were X number of vulnerabilities in a particular year. Uh, however, we're always going and backfilling previous years, so that number itself moves. And this here is a graph from OSVDB that shows the number of vulnerabilities that had been disclosed in 2012, but just in this last six months, they've been adding more and more. So even that number for older vulnerabilities is shifting. How can you base any stats and make decisions based on that kind of thing? So the VDB abstraction bias, uh, remember our crafted abstraction term, uh, externally some VD VDBs are basically worthless for generating meaningful stats. It's just something you have to accept. Or if you're going to generate stats off of them, you better disclaim it heavily. 
Um, almost no one gives criteria for a vulnerability or explains their abstraction. So Cooney even disclaims it, that uh, their database is not ideal for stats, which is very cool of them. Um, and as an example, Sakuni has 28 different advisories, that's 28 IDs for a single vulnerability. Why? Because they are more of an alerting service. If 15 of you in the audience use 15 different Linux distributions, you use their service so that you get vulnerabilities related to your distribution only. That's the way that they operate, that's the way they're intended to operate. IBM, for example, uh, 31541, one entry for an Oracle CPU with 30 different CVEs. So once again, now you have one ID that's 30 different vulnerabilities. OSVDB, we're the only ones that say we're going to do one for one as best as we can. But with all the vague disclosures out there, and with all the libraries and inbreeding of code, it's very difficult to maintain that. So what does VDB abstraction look like visually? How many entries are you going to make? So CVE may do... Uh, do three different entries, where we may do five, ISS and bug track may do one or two, but this is how it actually logically breaks down based on our criteria. And by the way, most of us don't have our criteria posted anywhere. And what's worse is that some of them uh, actually change their criteria randomly and arbitrarily. There's also the factor of unique and duplicate IDs. So if you look at CVE or BID, they have uh, flags saying rejected or retired. So these are active entries in their database that no longer correspond to a vulnerability because they were either rejected for one reason, they're duplicates, who knows. If you don't consider that in your stats, now you have another significant source of error. For ISS and OSVDB, we delete them outright. Um, ISS and SCUNY use multiple IDs, blah, 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 I did that. Uh, anyway, do stats consider this? Do they ever disclaim it? No. Another example, which I just mentioned, IBM X-Force, they used to do one ID per Microsoft issue. And if you go back to that early uh, chart we had showing um, the amount of Microsoft advisories versus the, the different VDB abstraction, well, that's because now they do two. They do one entry for the vulnerability and one for the missing patch. And that's to support all of their products. So it's a very logical reason that they're doing that, but if you didn't figure this out, and the only way you did is by monitoring their database and actually reading thousands of their entries. Yeah, you need to know this going into it. So what's our future look like? Uh, vulns are going to get weirder. They already have been. Stuff in pacemakers, some of the SCADA vulns, the library vulns. It's not an easy world to track. Um, it's harder to measure and quantify. Uh, the vulnerability chaining is something that we will probably never get to where uh, three, four different low uh, risk issues, some of which may not even be classified as a vulnerability or maybe a concern is the way we flag it, uh, lead up to remote code execution. You know, any of you pen testers, you know all about that vulnerability chaining and you know, steadily elevating your privileges. That's something we have to consider. So, Bad stats, we'll breeze through this because we're running out of time. My little proctor's being a, nah. Um, so bad statistics, it's usually from tunnel vision. Pro tip, we've already said this once, we'll say it 18 more times if it helps. Counting an ID of a vulnerability database is not counting a vulnerability for the most part, the exception being one. So most people go to CVE and they assume one ID equals one vulnerability, wrong. If I had some newspaper and could hit you on the face, I would. Survey of past studies. These are the ones that we used to quickly uh, look at how all of the bias plays in. So we have selection bias. Um, here's some examples. You can read up on these later. But basically, wrong, 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 wrong. You know, these are the big reports that you're reading, that your bosses are reading. All the executives are reading and saying, wow, there's all these vulnerabilities and look at the risk and blah, and we need to make decisions based on that. Yet, all of the statements are wrong. Um, here we have examples of the vulnerabilities versus CVEs. And uh, one of them, I actually called him out on uh, Alex Horan, of course, security. I called him out on Twitter and I wrote a blog about it. He fixed it very quickly, but not before news articles were written that basically parroted his results. So now everyone in the world read his results that basically said, oh, well, you know, that Microsoft advisory was a vulnerability. No, it's not. Uh, the invalids. Remember, CVE has 335 rejected, give or take, bid 550. Uh, so 
like I said, we started tracking those. We have 431 myth fake and 76 not of all. Not of all, we just added that classification recently. We haven't been able to backdate, you know, all 90,000 of our entries to that. If we could, it would be real fascinating. Um, Windows versus Linux. This is probably one of the number ones you see. We've covered this briefly. Anytime you see someone using statistics to say one operating system is more secure than the other, just walk away. Don't even take them seriously. No vulnerability data set out there can truly cover and answer that question. You can kind of go in the right direction. Once again, you have to qualify that yes, Linux had so many more disclosures, but first Linux is open. We get to look at all their code commits. A lot of people are looking at their code commits. Microsoft, no, it's closed. They release advisories based on external disclosures. So one of you goes to Microsoft, says, hey, here's a vulnerability, they fix it, then they release an advisory. Microsoft themselves, they find hundreds. Oracle claims that they have found thousands of vulnerabilities and fixed them internally with no advisory. So once again, where does that leave us with vuln stats if we don't even know where all the vulns are? Uh, mobile. Everyone's saying, you know, BYOD and mobile, what's the security? So this one uh, basically said, oh, look at iPhone. iPhone is so much more vulnerable. That's not the case. iPhone has been tracked completely wrong because they're looking at certain platforms and they're not considering all of the other software. Every WebKit vulnerability was counted against iPhone because WebKit is the basis of Safari. But they kind of forgot that WebKit's also the basis of the Android browser. So what do these stats even mean? Absolutely nothing. They haven't even begun to consider any of the sources. The browser wars. Uh, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, Chrome, you know. So we have all these fun little graphs and different ways of saying the same thing. We don't really know what the hell we're talking about. Anytime you see these, these stats are not accurate. If you don't believe me, one search. Go to osvdb.org, search WebKit. One of our guys has spent a stupid amount of hours going through all the WebKit vulnerabilities, and he's broken them all out. So now we have hundreds and hundreds of WebKit vulnerabilities. Who uses WebKit? Chrome? Safari? Did Opera decide, or they change their mind? They were looking at it? Uh, the Android browser, uh, like Chameleon or K-Chrome or whatever. There's so many browsers that use it. Now this is meaningless. From here on out, no one should ever compare browser stats unless you give a, a five-page intro explaining what WebKit is. So product stats, just don't do it. And that pretty much, oh yeah, the other fun part. So WebKit, they're nice. They will silently patch a vulnerability so that they don't inadvertently zero day Apple and Safari. Think about that one. Who discovered the most vulns? And we're running out of time, so we're gonna have to breeze through this. So this, uh, these stats came from somewhere else. Our stats said, no, you're wrong. So we said, okay, we're gonna look at it ourselves. Uh, number one, number two, number eight. That's why FFmpeg stood out like a sore thumb in 2012. Those guys are abusing the hell out of FFmpeg, finding all kinds of fun stuff. They haven't verified if all of them are exploitable. They're doing the Mozilla model. It's like, hmm, signs of memory corruption. We're not gonna spend the you know eight days required to come up with an exploit. We're just gonna say, yeah, it's probably bad. Let's fix it. So anyway, this also breaks down why these researchers are in the top whatever since January of 2012. There are specific reasons they're up there. The do's, uh, don't do of stats, yeah, no pi or bar, yeah. Sorry, buddy, you got about three minutes. That's all right. Uh, so we'll, we'll try and wind up with a little bit about uh, good stats. So um, uh, most of this includes examples from, from journalists. Uh, disclaim that counting is bad. That's a good example there. Uh, move towards other kinds of criteria or metrics besides vulnerability counts. Something that Brian Krebs did a couple of years ago was he looked at, okay, during how many days of the year was this particular software exposed to an unpatchable exploit that we knew about? And he used that to compare browsers. That's normalizing things 
based on a much better approximation of real world risk than just simply counting vulnerabilities. Um, in some cases, actually talking about how vendors don't necessarily always release um, their own internally found vulnerabilities, especially when you're comparing products from different vendors. Disclosing your methods, this is I think one of our big takeaways, definitely disclose your methods. Simply saying what database you're using is not disclosing your methods. What you do with that data, what your underlying assumptions are, maybe even talking to the people who operate that database to understand what's going on, uh, extremely important, we believe. And then also show your, uh, show your selection bias, okay? So um, that's, pretty, that's pretty important as well, is say, what were the criteria you used to select which things you're gonna study? And then how did you actually go and, and, um, and select those items? If you don't formulate your search query correctly, or if you ignore things like the, the web kit that Brian was talking about, you're gonna have a faulty sample and all your stats are just gonna suck. But at least if you're talking about how you did it, that can be verified and maybe even made repeatable or criticized if it has a, a problem with it. Also show your abstraction bias, how you're counting things, try and get more precise about your units of measurements. Okay, try and be good about your units of measurements. Uh, the journalists who are in the audience um, one phrasing that was used by Rob Lemos that I thought would be kind of efficient for word counts is the notion of, you know, vulnerabilities, but as counted by their CVE IDs or something like that. But to take a whole paragraph and describe things, I understand it's an issue. Yeah. Let me take over. Yeah. So real quick, uh, we didn't have time. Uh, there's all kinds of other good stuff. Yep, yep. So you, we're trying to show you how you can start to evolve, telling good from bad, uh, some departing observations for more exposure. Once again, download the slides. Not only is there more information in here, uh, all of the presenter notes, we have links, references, and then just for fun, all of the slides that didn't make the cut, we left them in. Just so you can see our madness and what else there is to consider. So with that, uh, if you have questions, we hopefully have answers, but we're going to evacuate the stage. We'll be right outside the front doors. Be happy to talk to you. Thank you. And still going.